Hello and welcome everyone to our panel session today on creating public trust in science. My name is Rebecca Winkles. I'm the Director of Communications and Strategy at Science in Dialogue, which is a German company for science communication. And I'm very happy today to be moderating your panel. So I'll keep my views on public trust in science to myself pretty much. And we'll just foster the conversation between our wonderful panelists today. Uh, first up, of course, ladies first, we have Dr. Susanne Hecker, who's the head of the Science Programme Society and Nature at the Museum für Naturkunde here in Berlin. So we know each other from Berlin. Welcome to the panel, Susanne. Um, we, she will be joined by Vivi Benoy, who is an associate professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore. So we have an Indian panelist as well. And we have Ro Rohit Chakravarti, who is joining us from India today, but who usually works here in Berlin with us at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research and who's a keen science communicator. And I'm very happy for you all to be here with me and to discuss this very important topic of public trust in science. Um, to start things off, I would like to pose a question to all three of you. And we're probably going to start with, um, with you, Susanna. Um, what are your thoughts on how public trust has been affected by the pandemic and what may have changed in the area? Do you think there are any major changes? Has anything evolved? What are your, your views? Yes, thank you very much uh, uh, for your kind introduction, Rebecca, and uh, hello uh, to everybody in the audience and of course hello to my co-panelists and I'm very uh, happy to meet uh, for the first time actually um, and get into discussion today around this topic uh, of public trust in science. Um, let me start with two things I would uh, uh, like to, to emphasize is first I'm not a researcher on the topic of public science, uh, public trust in science, but um, I'm focusing on uh, uh, questions of science communication with a special focus on participatory uh, formats, uh, including citizen science, um, where I'm involved in the community since uh, uh, almost a decade, uh, both nationally, but also on the European level and internationally. Um, in this panel, Basically, I will mostly speak for Germany <laughs> because I don't may, might not have um, enough evidence or experience in in the in, to speak for an international uh, uh, scope. So that's that's my preliminaries. Um, to get uh, into your question, Rebecca, I would say that. Um, we can see, uh, and of course there have been studies, um, um, amongst others, uh, through the uh, uh, VED, the uh, Science and Dialogue uh, that you that you belong to, um, where, that that show that uh, trust in science, public trust in science, has not decreased during the pandemic, um, or not uh, at least not um, uh, specifically. Um, and those who distrust science are a very, very small minority. And I think this is this is a point that that sometimes gets overlooked, overheard, <laughs> because this minority is very, very loud and it's very aggressive in terms of communication and going outside. And uh, so we see the, those uh, pictures on the media um, and this suggests that uh, the, the vast majority is distrusting science, which is not the case. So that is something that I would really like to emphasize and um, that's that's important another um, another point is that we we could see in in the and during the pandemic and still see this uh, because the pandemic is not over that we do have very prominent uh, um, science communicators not only in Germany um, I mentioned Christian Drosten for instance for Germany who's a very prominent figure but also others um, uh, in other countries uh, who have uh, who have been speaking very loud and very clear for science um, and have given evidence and facts to uh, the public. Um, and uh, it's I, I think it's very fascinating to look at them and how they have done this. Um, they have all of them have a very, very high expertise in their fields uh, areas um, uh, of uh, of uh, science. And they have a great ability to connect to people's everyday lives and their questions um, of daily concern. Um, and uh, maybe we can go into that a bit further uh, down the line in, in this panel discussion. But um, I think that's that's it's a very, very good uh, way of looking into what we can learn uh, for science communication in general, if we look at how some of those people really expose themselves uh, these days. Um, and it would be great if a, a larger majority of scientists were able 
and support it to do so um, because the pandemic will not be our last crisis and we know that we have other crises going on and we definitely need um, the public trust in science. So so just to wrap it up, I think this is a, it, we need, we, we do have a very, very complex situation and it's not easy to understand, it's not easy to, to explain and um, it's, it's highly complex so we, but, and we need that differentiation um, in communication uh, around these topics um, but we also need that uh, that kind of close collaboration um, between actors, um, and uh, uh, surely we we'll go into more detail later on. Yeah, thank you very much, Zana. Um, let's probably turn our views a bit over to India for a second. Uh, Binoy, what is the situation like? What has it been like with public trust in science over there? Uh, thank you very much. I also, I join the other panelists in welcoming all of you who found time to in, this, in your busy schedule on a working day to come and discuss with us. So trust in science in India also, I agree with Dr. Susan uh, that it didn't change much because I can say it with evidence. Uh, in the beginning of the pandemic or uh, just, just after the first wave was over, we conducted an online survey of around 1,500 people. So compared to the population of India, 1,500 is a very small number. But at that time, that was a that, that was we were able to gather that much people, as and we made sure that this information is coming from the educated community. It means that they should have at least a graduation uh, in order to attend the survey. So what we found was that the vaccine was not available in the market at that time. So one of the questions we asked was that, do you trust science? and the vaccine created by these scientists. And around 65% of people, they said that they are trusting the scientists as well as they are trusting, they have trust in the vaccine created by the scientists. And the second question, at the same time, we found that even though they trust the scientists, they said that we need more information. Means until and unless we get information, more information, they are not going to take the vaccine. And that count reaches up to 86% that preprint is available because that is still under review in a, in a journal. So preprint is available on research gate. If you give Indians attitude towards uh, COVID, you will see that information. So at that time, we found that it was actually in, in India, we were not that much, uh, we didn't expect such a trust in the, in, the, in the scientists and science. And we found that they are actually watching and they want the right information before taking an important decision that is vaccination. And uh, I again agree with uh, uh, Susan that uh, when the vaccine came and people were taking vaccine, the and when the second wave came and the people found that vaccine is useful to reduce the negative effects of the uh, the COVID, the trust in science increased further. So earlier during the time of uh, this th for this section, I don't have the data, but I have the conversations with people who put with whom. I regularly interact from different cross section of the life. What I found that during the time when the vaccine was not coming to the market, there was a discussion saying that, oh, your science don't have the capacity to bring the vaccine, what you people are doing, or when we will be getting the vaccine, will the vaccine come or not? These were the common thing, common terms, uh, repeatedly appearing in the WhatsApp chats. Because you know, it's, there are many WhatsApp groups in which I am a member of. So then what happened that, Vaccine came, then its effects was proved, and even the people from the villages went and took vaccine. And now they, I feel that they're trusting in science, and uh, its uh, trust in science has increased. Because I, during the Omicron wave, I was doing a lot of telephonic conversation, and I found one thing again and again reiterating that is, I have take, taken vaccine, I don't have to worry much about the negative effect of. So we found the different stages of trust formation, trust maintenance, trust regaining, everything during the three, two to three years in India. So I, uh, to wrap up my observations, yes, the trust didn't change much. I feel that it has increased because of the pandemic. Thank you very much. Um, I think the vaccine situation might be slightly different in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> 
bit of a different effect there. Um, but Rode, to get you into the conversation, um, you are a scientist yourself, and I know you're a keen communicator. So how has the pandemic affected Psycom and public trust from your view? Do you have any experiences on what it did to communicating scientists? Maybe how do you feel about it? Uh, yeah, I, I'll skip the pleasantries, but uh, but thanks uh, to I, I would particularly like to thank uh, the audience whom we can't see today, and thanks for joining. And uh, I look forward to a good uh, discussion with all of you. Uh, to jump to Rebecca's question, uh, I I actually agree with both Benoit and Susanna, and uh, and 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 like Susanna, I would like to uh, emphasize that I'm not a uh, I'm not a policy or you know I'm not a perspective researcher myself. So my information comes a bit from experience and a bit from uh, my reading on the subject of public trust in science. And it seems uh, to the, from my reading, it, the, the opinion seems to echo with what Benoit has uh, said that uh, Indians do trust science a lot. And uh, in, in fact, in one of the surveys, uh, which I read from uh, October 2020, which is you know just after the first wave uh, in India, um, there, it showed that uh, Indians actually were among the uh, were among the people who supported, who trusted science the most out of all the countries surveyed. So, so that's that's interesting. But uh, what I uh, do not quite understand. I mean, if, well, uh, well, to to talk about this first, uh, why I feel why I'm, um, that the, why I'm not surprised about uh, this aspect that Indians trust science quite a lot is a because you know well actually not a and b i would go just to the point myself uh that um indian society is actually quite hierarchical and you know whenever and the, our education system also is very top down so if something comes from uh, uh somebody claimed to be a higher up it is most often uh likely to be believed we are not unfortunately uh, at least up until my generation, I hope it's changing in the in the subsequent generations. Up until my generation, we were not really taught in school to ask the right questions. So we would mostly take, uh, we would mostly just inculcate whatever is being told. So that is one aspect of it. But the other aspect is, you know, I I don't quite understand how these surveys define science in the first place because if you are talking about People trusting science uh, for an Indian, for an uh, for for the average Indian, even something you know para scientific or uh, you know not even para scientific, something uh, mythological like astrology or uh, Ayurveda could also be considered as science. I'm not saying that these things don't work. Maybe they do, but we just have very little data to make a con convincing argument for them at this moment. So, so that's that's a caveat that these studies might have, and I'm not, of course, not talking about Benoit's study at, uh, because I haven't seen it, and uh, we need to, uh, yeah, we, we need to uh, read that properly. So, um, well, so but this is one thing to be con to, to consider while we're talking about these surveys. From my own experience, I think uh, when when COVID-19 broke out, and I'm as a bat researcher, I, uh, I I gathered a whole bunch of bat researchers in. Or in all of South Asia, and we started uh, reaching out to the to the uh, to the public through various forms of media. Um, I I really can't speak for the numbers because we didn't collect any data, but uh, it but it does it did seem like you know the outreach was making at least a bit of a difference because uh, well uh, because initially there were a lot of reports of people uh, wanting to kill bats and you know. Towards the later half, we stop seeing those reports. Where we don't know whether the media got bored of reporting such incidents or whether that was actually the case. But at least from my own experience of talking to people, it felt like you know they are finally realizing that bats are not uh, the culprits as they are portrayed to be. So yeah, so so that that's uh, that sums up my opening statement. That you know, a uh, trust in science. Uh, I'm not very surprised with uh, with the with the fact that Indians trust science, but there are reasons behind why that might happen. Two, we need to understand what science is in the first place in order to design these surveys. And three, that I have a faint reason to believe that outreach 
might have made a difference in with respect to uh, the demonization of that post covid uh, and and has changed to the perspective of the common of of the public Thank you very much. Um, to the audience, which we, uh, Susanna mentioned, it, we can't see you, so it's a bit, um, it's a bit unfortunate for us. But we are very happy to take your questions. So if you go to the tool and you ask your questions, I will bring them into the conversation as well. Um, all three of you have been speaking about a high level of trust. So the situation isn't as bad as many assume from the outer perspective and without looking at data, probably. And all three of you have mentioned that you believe that public outreach has actually made a difference. Susanna, if we could go a bit into, I mean, one of your expertise is uh, citizen science. Do you think that citizen science, A, during the pandemic, but more generally can contribute to public trust in science? and if so, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you believe that it can, but um, um, in what way and why is it an important tool for it? Mm -hmm. OK, yes, thank you. So, so just just an afterthought of, of also of what we discussed earlier, what we uh, from the statement is also what we need to consider is that uh, if people say they trust in science, that does not mean um, automatically that they behave um, the same way. So, so like um, um, uh, Binoy, you said that people show a high trust in science and, and a lot of them got vaccinated, which is great, which is super great. But I think we need to consider um, that this is not an uh, auto, um, this is not an automatic uh, um, thing that that if people trust in science, they also behave um, in a in in a, um, in a in a way that that is uh, in line with um, let's say what what science recommends. But that was just an afterthought. You asked about citizen science. And sorry for stumbling here a little bit, but uh, too many thoughts at the same time in my head. Um, so yes, um, I believe that. Um, Although there is a high trust in science, we see that uh, crises like biodiversity crisis or climate crisis, uh, we are still far away from uh, the point of change, uh, positive change. And I think what we really need is to engage um, in a very active way with people um, um, as scientists, I mean, um, but also other stakeholders. And I think that citizen science is a great tool, a great way of um, really collaborating with people. Um, maybe for the audience, if you haven't heard about the term citizen science, this is um, a research approach uh, where um, uh, people who are not, uh, let's say, uh, paid, uh, paid scientists, um, uh, some call them volunteers or citizen scientists or amateur experts. There's a whole bunch of, of different terminologies. Um, they work together with scientists um, on a specific uh, research question. And um, there are very different projects from contributor projects where people provide data to projects where really the, um, the public reaches out for scientists to work together with them to address an issue of their concern. Um, so this is a, it's, it's, a, it's a very broad field. But what it allows is that really people from the public uh, um, who are not uh, into this scientific topic, maybe, and uh, not doing this on a professional basis, they can work together with scientists. And that means that to very varying degrees, they get into communication, they get into interaction. Um, and this is actually what is the basis to create trust. If you work with someone, if you talk to people, if you work, uh, if, if you fulfill tasks together towards a, an, a common aim, this is what where trust can be built in a very substantial manner. Um, so what we can't prove right now is that we say, OK, we have um, um, 35 million people in Europe, let's say, involved in citizen science projects right now. And they th this creates um, for all of them that creates public trust in science. We can't say that, of course, because this this would be I mean, this would be maybe um, we could maybe model this, but <laughs> um, that would be a highly uh, sophisticated research design, which maybe would be worth it. But um, um, uh, what we can see is that that people um, do engage um, in a meaningful way. And let me just give you an example uh, during the pandemic, because this, this is just one of our topics today. Um, in the UK, um, there has been uh, um, set up um, a, um, 
um, it's called the COVID Symptom App, um, which was created by um, the King's College London and Zoe, which is a health science company. And they launched um, a, a COVID study app um, at the end of March 2020 um, to record symptoms of COVID-19. And um, the uh, developers reached out for the government and said, now, listen, we want to do this. We want to create this app. And we do have people who are eager to uh, contribute their data um, to this app. And this would be just a great tool um, to watch the pandemic, monitor the pandemic and the symptoms of, of COVID-19. Um, and first, the government was very, um, they were kind of reluctant to do that. Um, so um, they got, got into fundraising, uh, um, the, the developers got into a fundraising round. And um, within very short time, they had enough money. And especially they had over 4.6 million people taking part in the UK, the, in Sweden and the United States, where the app was downloadable. Um, and um, so, so it developed uh, even further. And at the end of the day, uh, because so many people took part and the, um, the resolution of the data was so good, uh, the government finally said, OK, this is this is such a great data. Please, let's integrate this into official data sets, which is now the case. Um, and um, of course, this helps uh, UK government managing uh, disease risks. And so I think this, this shows the potential that if you find something uh, for a citizen science project that is of relevance to people's everyday lives and what they are concerned about, then you have the absolute chance to get a lot of people involved. Um, and of course, I mean, if, if it's, it's only data, data gathering, it, it might be easier to get a, a lot more people than maybe if you have a co-created project where you sit together and do the research design and you discuss and negotiate research design um, together. That might be a very small group of people which might have a super important impact as well. I mean, this is I don't want to say that that only large scale projects are great or only co-created projects are well. Um, uh, this is not what I mean. I think citizen science offers very specific and great opportunities to create trust um, and enhance science communication in its best form um, and interaction. Susanna, um, we have a question for the audience that I would love to incorporate here because we've now just heard some best practice example and how citizen science and engaging people and making a match with their realities kind of can help to create trust. But um, Benoit, our audience wants to know a bit about what we can actually learn from the pandemic. And I think that what Zana just mentioned fits in very nicely because that is something we can actually take away where we see, oh, this worked. We should incorporate measures like that or apps like that into the future and into going forward. But Benoit, could you share your experiences? What do you think are the big takeaways from the pandemic and how can we improve Psycom afterwards? Yes, so I am starting with uh, Rohit's comment that, you know, uh, no, we have to, that is a very important thing when we say science communication or science or society, Indians, Germans, we are actually representing a huge heterogeneous society. So when you say science communication or I, if somebody says that X is an expert of science, generally that, that person will be an expert of only one branch of the science only. Similarly, the, the public, they are also heterogeneous. Even though I said that Indians trust in science based on our study, our group were focusing mainly on the people with graduation. So it represents only a segment of the community, but we generally what we do that we attribute it to the whole system or the whole population. So that we need to always keep in mind when somebody says that science communication, mainly it will be the, the methodologies of science which they will be trying to communicate because the content communication will be very difficult because I can speak only about a certain segment of the science only. Similarly, the people also, they are heterogeneous in their ability to understand the science because if you have a medical degree, if you have an engineering degree, people are different in their capacity to grasp what scientific information you are giving. So one of the things which we can do or at this kind of situation where you, there's a high demand of the knowledge because like the situation like pandemic is either you build a dedicated army of communicators or you make everybody a soldier. So this is the two options available. 
So I agree with uh, Professor Hecker what he said because citizen science is supporting build, converting everybody into an army. So similar kind of things we have seen because when we handle a huge number of people, diverse in their knowledge, diverse in their attitude, diverse in their in their values given, diverse in their belief systems, we need people to lead them from themselves. Because always we think that we can give the top-down approach, follow the top-down approach where we can pump the information. That generally don't work. Because another study which we conducted with uh, Swiss Academies of Science, Swiss Next, Swiss Next and Science Society in Switzerland, we checked the, the mindset of the, the, what communicators think about the science, science communication at the time of pandemic. We found that people trust scientists and in universities and international organizations than policy makers, journalists, and other kind of communicators. So uh, there are many other studies. I saw a paper from Germany also recently. So the thing is that we have to understand that because we are diverse, but the problem is so common. And we need to bring people from that group itself whom they trust. Because when we talk about trust, it has two components. One is the epistemic trust, another one is the interpersonal trust. Epistemic trust means we believe a piece of information. Like somebody says that, or even if my mother says, my father says, my P3 professor says, I believe that sun will be rising in the East Army. Another one is interpersonal trust. Interpersonal trust means we trust somebody and we believe whatever that person says. So what we have to do that, the pandemic gave us an opportunity to study and communicate more medical science. So the waste problem, like what masks created, how this uh, sanitizer we use is going to contribute to the climate change in cotton got, or how the people we can convert the existing system for climate change, which is another big chronic issue we are facing, we never discuss. Because you know, when the demand comes, based on that demand, we generate knowledge. And along with that, we have to be careful because when there is a demand, the fake things also comes to the market. So obviously we found that pandemic, along with the pandemic and epidemic also. So what we learned from the pandemic is that bigger problems requires the convergence of the energy from every sector of the society. And, with, and we need to consider that diversity and heterogeneity while designing any program. Third thing we found is that, yes, we may be divided in Indians, Germans, uh, some other nations, but if a pandemic kind of issue comes, it affects humans. Yeah, I think that's a very... Want. Correct. So for the first time, I, we were able to download a lot of paper. People like us from third world country, many times we wanted the free one. So we saw that we need to do that. We need, a, we, we need to use the collective intelligence of the humanity to solve this kind of big problems. That was the biggest lesson we found, learned during the pandemic. I hope that this will be continuing because there is an issue because this stress induced the behavioral change is short-lived generally. So we hope that it will be continuing for a long period. Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much. Um, I think you've answered one or given a view on one of the other audience questions, which was that uh, trust and science has two ends of a continuum and that science is based on facts and trust is influenced by the perception of health. Of, um, of facts and thus by the people who are actually receiving the facts. So I think you kind of have answered that question as well or taken up on it. Um, one thing that I find very interesting uh, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it, Robert, because you're a scientist and um, scientists are becoming more and more important in science communication. Both examples just given in introduce that scientists have to be actually the brokers of scientific information and have to go out there and engage with uh, parts of the public. Is it? It's not in your original script of becoming a scientist to be a communicator. How do you find that and how how stressful is it to suddenly be demanded as a communicator as well in a way? That's an interesting question. And uh, before I start with that, uh, I, I would like to acknowledge that I completely agree with both Susanna and Benoit, which actually makes things a little worse for the audience because they're not going to see a fist fight happening here. But <laughs> but uh, but yeah. Now coming back to your question, I uh, it was um, um, 
well it was partly unscripted for me uh, and the reason why i say partly is because i've always loved communicating about uh, not not science but you know i've always loved speaking in front of an audience and i've been doing that since the the end of my school days but it only took a proper um uh, proper purpose uh, when covid uh, when coronavirus broke out and batch were demonized so so and the most and and so so that was the time when uh, i i did a pod i mean i appeared on a podcast i appeared on a youtube video i did a lot of presentations for uh, and they were actually quite uh, well received because you know there were back to back presentations and still more than 250 500 people turned up for those webinars so they so so the information was reaching out to new and newer people every time and uh, i tried to diversify in languages well i can only do hindi and english but you know we created a bunch of uh, we brought a bunch of other bat researchers and we tried to do the outreach in at least 10 different indian languages which makes a lot of difference in a linguistically diverse country like india particularly coming to the point that binoy was mentioning that we inherently have a very 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 heterogeneous community and we need to reach out to uh, everyone so uh, so the most important thing that i learned uh, from this experience is that you know in in the time of a crisis people need to see a face that they can trust i'm not saying i'm i'm a face that people can trust but uh, but what i mean to say is um, information about science information about uh, about crises uh, like diseases or political crises are mostly conveyed to us by older looking men who are you know who are in the tv screen and they're passing the information to us and you don't have the chance to ask them questions so in times like these people want to see a face for example christian rosten like uh, susanna mentioned so you know when a scientist takes the stage it creates a a much uh, it creates a different impact uh better or worse is a different thing but you know at least people see a face that they can ask questions to who can explain rationally uh to the audience what this whole process is and to me science communication is all about you know science communication and science education is all about creating a rationally thinking society where a society is able to i mean you give them the background knowledge through which they can ask the right questions for example and that's that's exactly uh not exactly but that's that's the kind of approach that i was focusing on when i was reaching out to people i i don't call myself a science communicator but you know what i was doing at that time was was doing public outreach so so and that that's that's the point i was focusing on uh if people ask the right question they wouldn't be scared about that so when i mean if people the moment they read the news where um and everything in the newspapers is simplified and you know it's not nuanced so the newspaper simply put a click clickbait headlines like bats are the source of corona virus and then that creates panic so but if people had the background knowledge to ask themselves are uh, you know that the virus was originally detected in china do the indian uh, bats also carry the virus a uh, these bats for example before we started this conversation binoy was talking about this uh, call a big colony of bats that has been roosting in that place for over 15 20 years you know if people had uh, the background knowledge to think uh, that this colony of bats has been living here for so long nothing has happened to us yet how i mean how is it suddenly changing you know suddenly a virus breaks out in china and then we go on a rampage killing bats that we have lived with for 15 to 20 years so you know that's that's the that's the kind of uh, attitude that we need to develop among uh, among people through our communication yeah thank you very much um but no one one group that is particularly close to your heart i think are are uh, are students and school children um could you tell us a bit more about your efforts to get them involved in science through the uh, student scientist program that you developed yeah so the student scientist is a is a kind of citizen science like uh, uh, susan has said but here there is a difference 
uh, generally you know what happens that in a heterogeneous society which which has the re re reduced access and availability of the normal system what happened that the compartmentalization becomes very solid so i studied in a uh, village school in india and i did my studied up to my phd in a college located in a village region so what happens that generally students of different level will not get will not be getting the access to the information which they want so when i became a faculty in a school in a college just before i joined with the national institute of advanced studies what i found was that whatever the children are learning in their classroom is available in the nearby college but they never interact and they never and two different levels of knowledge systems are available but they never interact second thing i was found was that like uh, rohan just said now you know when there is a hierarchy it's very difficult for the people to go and ask them if you say that you have to go and ask to an agriculture officer what i should do with my wheat or my paddy a villager will say that uh, okay we will do that and he or she will not go there but we found that the school teachers are like highly accepted people in indian villages so the question started how or why we should why we are not converting the schools as a system for connecting science with society so then what happened that when you go to school you need uh, resources for that correct and the school system also easily don't accept somebody from outside so then what we did that we found the nearby colleges and we built a cluster and we connected the schools with colleges using the alumni of the school now studying the college so then you have, you have the resources available on one side the people in demand of the knowledge is available on the other side and now the only thing required is a is it some is an agency which can connect them easily so we did an experiment in different parts of india and we found that this works the system works because the only thing like we were talking about a trust the schools were not trusting that somebody who comes new to that area but that is managed by the alumni their alumni says that i am coming from the college and i have this thing to do they are also very happy because you know they are coming back to the schools as a researcher in cotton and initially it was known as student network then we found that uh, we get a doctor we get an engineer we get everything in the villages but we never get the scientists so we changed the program's name into student scientists which clicked then work went on then what we did that now you have different levels of knowledge accessibility and availability of knowledge skill set now we connected it with some of the researchers from the field and we start to study the pupils in that area in 2008 no sorry my so then what happened that we learned a lot from that system and then we extended to the other things like water and other things and uh, we before the pandemic with other group we even tested something whether we can monitor the population of mosquitoes in an area with the support of college children so they came out with information then we made an app uh, with our other collaborators and they were given to the, the other members of the society because like i said you know if you want to do evidence based uh, interventions you need data and the trust in science or scientific information is a dynamic system it changes so is the people so you need like a digital twin nowadays people says the data from both end so who is going to collect that data so we found that yes now it's possible because everybody has a mobile phone and everybody is a sensor the thing is that you have to design the task in such a way that everybody can do that so then you can collect that much amount of data and you can do that the student scientist is was it was actually a dream to convert the schools in the village as a center for knowledge which is linked with all other colleges and research institutions in india so that for instance it happened during when i was in the, there that somebody found a pest on the paddy in order to get it identified and what pesticide is to be pumped it takes at least one week up to that then everything will be over so we were able to send that message to some of our friends the information came and the society was selected so the thing is that see we have lot of knowledge available we have lot of demand for the knowledge we don't have a connecting system so like i was telling let's connect it together and to find who needs the, the the knowledge and how we can give them in a language that they can understand and utilize so that is the idea of citizen science it's still functional because of the covid it became a little bit down but now it is expected that it will be again taking the moment
Yeah, I think uh, Susanna raised her hand and wants to add something to that. I would love to sneak in another question to you as well, uh, Susanna, if that's OK, from the audience, which is, um, do you think that, so how can we, in citizen science, we very often have the thing that where, unfortunately, the citizens are mostly used for data collection. And in how far can we overcome that deficit to actually make them learn something? So if you feel free to add to what Benoit said, but if you could incorporate the answer. Yes, that. sure. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rebecca. I didn't, and I, also I didn't want to blow up your scheme, <laughs> but I, I just, I love the way that, Benoit, you, you just described your way of, of approaching this, this, um, these difficulties and these, these challenges by, by observing and by learning and by adapting. And I think this is this is so great, um, and it's not often heard of. It's it's a process. We are in in, in a process of of um, finding good solutions to 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 um, uh, maybe to given um, circumstances, but then also overcoming them and and really creating an impact. And I really loved your story, and I think that that we should also um, take a moment and shed light on. The, the abilities, uh, not only resources and capabilities that needs, but also the abilities of researchers, of scientists to do that. And I think, I don't know what the, the, what, what the current state is in, in India, but I know that, um, for instance, here in Germany, we really want to go more into uh, a profession, profession, professionalization, sorry, professionalization of public engagement for scientists. Um, because I think that that um, of course there are already um, a lot of good um, uh, people uh, doing a great job in communicating. But I mean, this is this is this is um, um, such a task to to what you you just uh, sketched, Rohit. If you want to engage to get uh, more engaged with the public or doing science communication, um, I think we really should um, support our researchers and scientists in doing so along their career and that might be very small and very very specific at the beginning but that might grow into something bigger and um, um, this is what this is why also we at uh, the Museum for Naturkunde um, together with uh, um, the Humboldt University and the Robert Bosch Stiftung we um, uh, uh, built a the so-called Berlin School of Public Engagement and Impact, um, where we is, uh, especially uh, want to support uh, researchers along the line in uh, getting more professional around uh, public engagement, but also creating um, a whole new system of not only enabling the scientists, but also enabling um, public engagement professionals. Um, which is very common already in the UK, for instance, or in other um, uh, uh, countries uh, worldwide, but maybe not so much in Germany. But I think this is that, I mean, it would be great to have you, Benoit, just to telling your story um, to our researchers again, because I think it's, it's perfect. It's, it's, it's a very, very nice story um, of, of how, you, how you got along and, and the challenges you face and, and how this grows even further. Um, and so um, as we create knowledge, we know more and we have more questions, right? Um, so coming back to the question of the audience, um, I'm always struggling, I have to be very honest, uh, with that kind of question because um, there is a tendency to um, look down um, uh, on people who collect data. And I think we have to be very careful in citizen science to um, to really look at people and what they want to contribute and how they want to contribute. And I think we should, we should avoid saying, uh, oh, contri only contributing data means using people, which is, I think, very top down because speak to them and ask them, do you feel used? Is that, is that what you want or would you be head of that science program? We don't speak to people. We, this is an assumption that we use them. Uh, so I would be very careful in terms of terminology here as well. Um, and I think there is uh, there is benefits and impacts to all kind of approaches um, in citizen science. It might be great to get data points and it might be is exactly what people want to do. They want to get an app on their phone and they want to observe their birds. They don't want any contact. They don't want anything to do with the scientists. They don't want to ask questions. They want they want to have that app and get uh, uh, feedback on what, what their data point has contributed to. And they are fine with that. And there might be other people who say, oh, but I have really great expertise and I do have... Uh, 
I don't know, health issues that I would like to tackle in my environment. Um, uh, so please, let's get, let's sit down, let's discuss them, and let's let's find a, a research scheme that everybody uh, can contribute to, but also that that I can use in my argument with the local authorities, for example. And there are projects that work like that. So so that that would be my answer. Be careful in 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 assuming things. Um, and don't, because there are more projects that collect data than co-created projects, that doesn't mean that they are, they, they are of less value. Thank you very much. I think that's a very, very um, promising view on that uh, issue, maybe. <laughs> and I think it's a very, it's a very important thing to come down to. We have one other question from the audience, which I find very interesting. And we have spoken a bit about, um, about, top-down approaches in communication and the importance of prominent politicians, policymakers, scientists um, of a very high level talking about it. And the question from the audience is, when the top-down approach is considered in communication, often it seems that some statements from the people in the top, on the top can actually deter or deflect from science. And how can we prevent and reduce that? So, the issue being politicians who are very powerful and have a voice in society, at least, how can we prevent damage that can come from them deterring from science? It's a very easy question to answer, I think, so please be brief. Um, but I think it is one of the crucial questions that we have to answer in this um, reign or something. Does anyone want to have a go at it? I'm not going to leave you alone if you can't answer it to the fulfillment of everything. Benoit, go, come on, yes. say. Uh -huh. There are two things because, you know, let's consider information as a uh, reagent or whatever it may be. Okay, like think that you are getting a reagent or you are uh, not reagent, like a, a ray of light. Until and unless it falls on you or you resist it, it don't affect you, correct? So the thing is, like I said, uh, the, the literature on science communication, trying to understand the cognitive aspect of science communication has shown that when there is a power, so there is a very famous statement by uh, Yuan Harari, because you know, when there is a, uh, when the power comes, generally it's easy for the information to get modified. Because, and he says that power continues by modifying the information or making the information more popular. So that cannot be avoided because if there is demand for that or the option for that, that will be happening. And that happens with all the alternative facts, uh, fake news and all that. We saw during the time of pandemic. So the only thing what we, I feel is that if we know, but at the same time that person says, that, that, that big politician says that uh, there is uh, water in Pluto. Generally people may or say that there is my party in that Pluto. Do you think that people will be accepting it? No. So the thing is that we need to, so generally when uh, I hear from my, one of my PhD supervisors used to say that, whenever you hear something, your mind should be asking uh, to it. So the public also should say that, when somebody says that, somebody says that if you inject disinfectant into your body, the corona will be dying. So you can, they can say that, prove it. So that culture of asking for prove it, that we should promote. It's not easy, like uh, you said in the beginning. But slowly, if you start from the beginning onwards, we have changed. If you see the history, you can see that. We ask more questions now. With the social media, you get a lot of chance. At least you can type if you don't want to ask with a fake ID that this is not going to work. And the likes and comments affects. So make the people, uh, we, or provide the people for the capacity to at least ask the question, prove it, or then asking for the evidences whoever may be the person giving that information. That's the only solution because it's an arm race. One said they will be coming out with new strategies like the advertisements. Here also you will have to prepare your uh, people. You need to continue this. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Roy, do you wanted to add something to it? Yeah, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, I think uh, what I would like to say is uh, in, in a situation like this where power, where the information is get it, getting vetted by power, that is, uh, that is a classic situation where uh, we need more scientists to, you know, to write, to share their opinion 
on on a particular issue and that is something that you don't often see a lot of scientists doing uh, i mean i i'm i'm completely in favor of you know creating jobs exclusive jobs in science communication it is not something that scientists should be doing on top of their contracts for for free but you know this is a case where they have the expertise on the subject and they either need to unite or write separately to an editor or write separate opinion pieces or make certain opinion videos uh, counter countering the information that is being shared uh, from the from the powerful side thank you very much yeah i think that is a very crucial point and i see susanna is nodding in uh, in appreciation for that statement so susanna uh, take it away if you want to i can't hear you yet do you need to Unmute yes, sorry. So, uh, yes, um, I took down my hand, but didn't open the, the mic. So, so what this shows, actually, what what uh, you said um, is is we need to engage more. We need to engage more with the public to 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 teach them, to show them that we that, that also we as scientists and research as researchers, we say prove it. Where's the evidence for it? Um, and and to to really get that into the the heads of people um, of how science works, how how this this conquest of of knowledge of of best knowledge that that we have available just works. Um, and on the other hand, I think that what what you said, um, it was. Uh, getting more into kind of public affairs um, and I think that 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 would be also something um, that we as research uh, uh, institutions or research um, uh, yeah, um, should should really get more engaged with because this this kind of uh, scientific advice and and getting more into uh, communicate more with uh, the the policy decision networks is really crucial because we do have I mean let's be very honest um, we do have an obligation a democratic obligation as uh, um, uh, public research institutions to support the democracy. Because otherwise, I mean, that's that's the basis for our jobs, right? This is this is this is the basis of what we do, of what we what what we are trying to 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 do and deliver. And for that, I think we do have an obligation to go out there and do this kind of communication. This is not easy. It's not easy, and we might not know how to do it. But then let's let's face it and let's say, okay, let's look. How can we do it? How can we get better? How can we go out there and learn um, and look around and, and be very reflective about what we learn and how we learn and what we can do better in the future? I think it's it's the times are over if we look at the crisis that we are facing. Time is over to say, oh, we are doing enough. Oh, it's fine. Um, and how we do it is good. It's good enough. No, it's not. Actually, it's not. So, so um, yeah, getting really emotional here, but but I think it's it's really time um, time to do that to step out, um, and that is it's not easy um, for researchers, maybe also younger researchers, junior researchers who say, oh my God, I have to struggle with so many things, um, and it's not in my evaluation scheme um, if I do this kind of uh, um, communication or public engagement efforts or public affairs efforts. Um, this might also be a, a uh, 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 turn down my my career, and I think we need to change these things as well. It's it's really a a, a change of uh, not only profession professionalization of public engagement or science communication, but also we need to really rethink our systems um, and reward systems uh, for scientists. Yeah, thank you for that um, addition to what Rod was suggesting. I think I think that is at least the current state of the art discourse we have about those issues in Germany and I think internationally as well. So it's very good to mention them here. We are coming to the end of our discussion already, unfortunately, uh, which is really sad because I feel we could talk about about this going on for hours. But um, maybe as a closing question to each of you, um, we've now talked a bit about how to create trust. We've talked about what went well and what maybe didn't go as great during the pandemic, though I think we, we kind of agree that there are a lot of things that went actually quite well from a science communication perspective. So my closing question to you would be, Thinking back about the pandemic, but also looking forward, what do you think are the most important things we have to do now to be more capable of dealing with 
um, the future of science communication and possible other crises. I mean, there's no there's no no lack of crisis mode at the moment with uh, things about climate change as a communication goal. I think the change of the energy system. So we have a lot of things going on. What can we learn from the past three years almost <laughs> um, to um, go forward? Um, I'm going to kick things off with you, Benoit, and then um, go to Roet and Susanna in the end. Yes. Yeah, Thank so quickly speaking, we need to see uh, like I said in the beginning of our discussion, on one side, scientists are working long hours to generate the evidence-based information, no matter whether it is climate change, no matter whether it is vaccine, whatever. On the other side, people are in demand of this information. So like Rohit said, like uh, Dr. Susan said, we need to find a connecting link which can provide the bi-directional communication between these two systems. And this bi-directional communication system should be the trustable source of information for the public. Because when you say something, public are in, generally, you know, when something unfamiliar comes or the uncertain comes, people becomes very emotional or very, you know, that, that uncertainty can compel them to take a lot of decisions. So the studies on human decision making has shown that generally people are cognitively miserly. All of us don't want to take any decision. So generally what we will do that, we will follow what some others are saying. So that question like uh, that politician's question you asked, generally what happened that we believe, we trust many people like Rohit said in the beginning that this person is the, so the, the only person who can help you. So we need to come out with more interaction between these people so that, you know, if I have a concern about something, about vaccine or about that, I should have a system where I can ask that and get a reliable and trustworthy answer. And the second thing I want, I, I, I see that we should immediately do is, I was going through a paper from Professor Brossard group in the Foundation Science, which says that, see, generally what happened that our big activities of, for science communication ends up in people who are interested in science. And science. Because, you know, if you see the audience of this, if you do a poll, you will see that a majority will be having a science background or what maybe from the science. So generally what happened that this discussion develops into an echo chamber. We have to broaden this echo chamber. We need to add everybody into this echo chamber, every citizen into this chamber where this information can change more. And the third, last, third and last and third point is the higher level of social media, you know, which works like a catalyst for every kind of information. We need to think how we can manage the information which is communicated in end-to-end encrypted mode. Because in uh, India, we found that WhatsApp is one of the biggest medium where we don't know, where you don't get any API to do any study. We don't know what kind of information is being communicated between these people. And they have very high potential than us yeah. who speak for science. That's all from my side. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think I agree to all of the above. Rohit, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Yeah. I have, I have three quick points on this. The first one, uh, we definitely need proper and uh, we need proper jobs in science communication, more, which means more funding. And I think one of the greatest funders are people who have been commercializing science for a long time, which is academic publishers. And there's been, there's a lot of profit uh, that they generate and a lot of it can go into creating jobs in science communication and specifically science journalism. And speaking for India, there's not a lot of, you know, solid science journalism that's happening in this country. Which is, which is very crucial. The second is for scientists uh, who are, who are uh, passionate about communicating, they need to make themselves heard. They, don't, they, need to be, um, they need to be bold enough to get onto the stage, communicate in the language of the, of the masses. And, uh, because, and I agree that you know, a lot of these things are done for free, but so, the, so is a lot of academic reviewing. And we do a lot of uh, free labor for publishers and you know for, for, for our careers but and surely we can do this for the society. Um, the third point uh, is about um, what was it about? I think I got lost in these two points. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I think I think these were the two main points which is why I placed them in the front. <laughs> oh yes, the third thing, the third thing, sorry, the third thing is to make people realize in our science communication that we are all inherently scientists. We 
cook every day, which is the most basic form of science that we do every day in our day-to-day -day lives. And once this realization comes to the people that, you know, marrying somebody from a different horoscope to align the stars is not going to make you a better cook. It's the skill and the training that does. So, you know, people need to realize this to, to, be, to become ra a rationally thinking society. Thank you very much. So the last words are for you, Susanna. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, you said, uh, let's get the people into, our, uh, into this chamber. And I would say, let's open the chamber of secrets, <laughs> so to say, <laughs> and go where the people are and talk to them. Let's, 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 let's um, reinforce our efforts, um, listening, talking to people, interacting with people. And, and with that also, I would like to, to invite the audience. Um, um, we have an, in the exhibition hall number two, um, in this lovely event, uh, there is the, the Leibniz uh, Research Museums uh, presenting themselves. And uh, my museum is one of those uh, museums and uh, would be great to, to have a chat and continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Continuing the conversation is a very good uh, last statement and I think that's what we are all going to do in various capacities. I thank you so much for joining us on the panel today. Uh, it's lovely chatting to you about creating public trust in science but now let's get back to work and actually create trust in science. Have a lovely day. Thank you.